Great. Um, Jack, you had mentioned that, um, or just at the beginning, what Ajahn Chah said about, you know, really, and of course what the Buddha said about teaching in the idiom of the people. And what have you both found the idiom of the people to be um, over these 40 years? And has what you've emphasized in the beginning, have you, de you know, what have you emphasized and conversely de-emphasized as you've started to learn more about um, how to reach people here? I mean, that's, that's a really, um, to me, a very big question because we're still really in the middle of figuring it out. But one of the things, it won't be our generation, it's really a long-term process. Um, one of the things that I think characterizes our community and made it really interesting is the fact that we were able to bring over some of the greatest teachers from our tradition, from Thailand and Burma, Mahasi Sayadaw and Ajahn Chah and Manindraji and Mahagosananda and so forth. And then, for better and for worse, they went home, <laughs> right? <laughs> and usually, if the Roshi or the Lama or something stayed, they would make a center, and you'd go into it, and it would feel like you were entering little Japan or little Tibet. You know what I mean? It had all the cultural trappings. But they said, all right, looks like you're doing good enough anyway. Good luck. We're going home, <laughs> you know? And as Sharon said, we did more or less all of this in the early years without adult supervision. <laughs> so um, we were pretty young. I was 29 when I started to teach Joseph. I was 30. Sharon was 21. <laughs> um, but with that, then we began to look and say, oh, people sit in chairs here. They could sit cross-legged, but they also could sit in chairs. We didn't need to have robes or um, need to have chanting or those kind of more cultural or religious, monastic, various sort of observances. They were beautiful, but they weren't necessary. And the kind of simplicity um, that you talked about, Joseph, of if you want to understand the mind, sit down and observe it, really became the core of what mattered. Then I'll just add one more thing, Joseph. There's so many ways other. So that, that changed. Um, keeping the simplicity without that cultural overlay I think made it accessible to people. And it's why mindfulness has spread, I think, so widely. Um, and then the other kinds of themes are um, that uh, one of the most important ones is that we saw that people in this culture could use spiritual practice, as Chogyam Trimpa talked about, as spiritual materialism. It could easily um, activate a kind of striving and ambition and with it a kind of trying to get rid of yourself or, you know, map together with a lot of self-judgment. People would do that. And so we started to add a great deal of loving kindness and compassion practice. Um, and that's been really critical. And most everybody heard that story about a number of us sitting with the Dalai Lama and asking him a question about uh, self-hatred. And how do you teach people who have that? Because judgment and self-hatred are so common. And he couldn't understand the word. He speaks pretty good English. Self-hatred, and you go back and forth with the translator. What does this mean? After a while, he kind of understood. He looked and he said, but, but this, is a, this is a mistake. Why would you do this? You know? <laughs> um, but it turns out that as people begin to sit, there's a layer of our self-judgment and self-criticism that needs to be addressed with compassion rather than with more striving. And that allows um, dharma practice to deepen. That's only when the attention that you bring is married to loving kindness or compassion that things even want to open. Otherwise, you're still kind of struggling or judging the way things are. And when there's both loving, uh, when there's loving awareness, when the two are together, then a kind of freedom quite naturally starts to open. And I think the whole flavor of the way we've taught has included more and more metta and compassion. Mm 